Good morning. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, fifth standing meeting of the House uh, Committee on Banking and Insurance. Uh, I would like to recognize a special guest that we have in the room today, my good friend, Leader Rudy. Uh, and in his honor today, we're going to do something I've never done before, but I've always wanted to do. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll and would you call it in reverse? Representative Westrom. Yeah. Representative Upchurch. Representative Stevenson. Representative Smith. Here. Representative Santoro. Representative Roberts. Representative Pollock. Here. Representative Meredith. Representative McPherson. Here. Representative Lockett. Here. Representative Cole Carney. Present from my annex office. Thank you. Representative Koenig. Representative Kirk McCormick. Here. Representative Hatton. Here. Representative Gooch. Representative Fraser Gordon. Here. Representative Flannery. Here. Representative Fisher. Here. Representative Bentley. Yay. <laughs> Vice Chair Lewis. Here. Chairman Rowland. Here. Uh, we do have a quorum and we are authorized to conduct business this morning. Uh, do we have any com committee members seeking recognition or have guests in the audience that they'd like to recognize? If not, uh, we will uh, we will get started. Senator Carpenter's not here yet, so we'll get started with House Bill 258. <laughs> and if he's not here after we're done, uh, Representative Fraser Gordon will present his bill. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with House Bill 258 this morning. Uh, this will be Representative Tipton's bill. Uh, it is a discussion on uh, hands-free driving, an issue that Representative Tipton has worked on for several sessions. Uh, Representative Tipton, when you're ready, if you would introduce your guest, I think you have a couple online uh, as well. Make sure everybody knows uh, who is here with us, and you may proceed. Thank you, Chairman Rowland. It's an honor to be here this morning. I've never presented in banking and insurance before, so it's an honor to be here, uh, possibly at uh, Chairman Rowland's last meeting as chair. I appreciate your service to the House and to the Commonwealth. Uh, I have with me this morning, you all may know Mark Tresh with the Insurance Institute. Online, we have with us this morning Bruce Langsberg. He is Vice Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, and we also have uh, Jennifer Smith with an organization called StopDistractions.org. Uh, Recently, I was uh, driving from Lexington back toward Frankfurt, back toward home. Uh, I saw a sign on the side of the road that said, Buckle up, phone down Kentucky. Uh, and that reminded me of a sign that when I went to the Southern Legislative Conference back in the summer in Nashville, driving down 65, when I crossed into the Tennessee line, I saw a similar sign. It said, buckle up, phone down. However, there is a difference between those two signs. In the state of Tennessee, both of those uh, situations are traffic offenses. In the state of Kentucky, it's only the seatbelt law that applies. Now, you may ask, well, we've got law. Several years ago, the legislature did pass laws against texting. However, since that time, there have been many more uh, apps that are out there. Uh, we've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, probably even uh, many more. And I was hoping Representative Koenig would be here this morning because I'm very concerned that if House Bill 606 passes, we're going to have a lot of people driving down the road placing wagers on their phone while they're driving and I know he would not want that to happen but y'all be sure and remind him of that when you see him I certainly will uh, I got a press release last April and this is the third session that uh, I have filed this legislation I've had the opportunity twice uh, to present this in the interim to the Transportation Committee but I've never been to B&I before, but I, I got a, a press release dated April 27th of 2021, and it was from NCOIL. Any of y'all know what NCOIL is? Y'all familiar with that organization? And it, it was to let everybody know that NCOIL adopted the Distracted Driving Model Act uh, back at that time. And there, there's even, Chairman Rowland, there's even a quote from you in here. Uh, it said, Kentucky Representative Bart Rowland, uh, chair of the B and C committee said we've had a lot of hard work on this model and had extensive discussions for, for several months. And uh, this year, uh, we tried to adopt uh, the prince, a lot of the principles from the in-call model legislation into House Bill 258. And uh, I think uh, 
as I'm reading the purpose statement of the In-Call Model Act, I just want to share that with you because I think it applies to what we're doing here today. This model provides a structure to strengthen distracted driving laws across the country by establishing a comprehensive, hands-free law to curb driver distraction, including manual, visual, and cognitive distraction to reduce highway fatalities, save lives, reduce auto crashes, and make roads safer. The model enables law enforcement to ticket drivers for holding a mobile device and limits use of a mounted or hands-free device while operating a motor vehicle, including texting, viewing videos or images, entering data, and talking or broadcasting content. Exceptions are provided for emergencies for certain voice-activated technology for navigation and for single swipe activation as long as the device is not held by the driver or used to engage in viewing distracted content. The increased prevalence of smartphone technology and expansion of its capability and potential for use has exacerbated distraction behind the wheel. I make a motion. Second. This one's for discussion only this morning, but I appreciate your. <laughs> I thank you so much. I appreciate your support, Representative. Re Pollack. Representative Pollock, I'll be back next year. Okay, I'll be I'll be back next year. But uh, and I want to finish along with heightened public awareness, targeted research and development of technology to mitigate risk. The enactment of primary enforcement laws is an important part of the strategy to reduce tragic traffic deaths and life-altering crashes. And I mention that because it's come to my attention that some people may have some uh, concerns about this being a primary offense. And, and from everybody that I've talked to, if this is not a primary offense, it will not be effective at all. Uh, there's a lot of organizations. Before I forget it, I, I've got representatives from Kentucky Motorcycle Association leadership in that organization uh, on behalf of their 180,000 members across the state who are here to show their support. Uh, I'll be happy to get more into the content if you have questions in, the min in a few minutes, but I think I'd like to have my guests have the opportunity to share this morning. So Mark, why don't you start off there? Thank you, Representative. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, as Representative Tipton said, I'm Mark Trish. I'm the Executive Director of Insurance Institute of Kentucky. We are the State Trade Association for Property and Casualty and Life Insurers. And this bill, I, I just want to tell you three things. This bill is the number one priority for my members this session, mainly because my members are the ones that uh, process the claims that result from distracted driving. Second thing I want to tell you is there was a poll done by Mason-Dixon Polling in January of this year, and your constituents are for this bill. Uh, the top line of it was 81% of your constituents statewide favor this bill. And the third thing I want to say is just echo what uh, Representative Tipton said. Uh, we view this bill as important, so we will be back next year with Representative Tipton to uh, bring this bill, hopefully, for a vote. Uh, with that, I'll conclude and then defer to either uh, Mr. Landsberg or Ms. Smith. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Langsberg, are you available to offer some comments? I hope so, sir. Uh, how do you hear me? Uh, we do hear you. Thank you, sir. Very good. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Rollin and committee members. And thank you for providing the National Transportation Safety Board this opportunity to discuss our recommendations on distracted driving. The NTSB is an independent federal agency charged by Congress to investigate transportation accidents and crashes across all modes, determine their probable cause, and make recommendations to prevent a recurrence. Those recommendations are our most important product. As a result of the investigations, we have seen firsthand that distracted driving is a growing and life-threatening problem, including a 2010 crash on I-65 near Munfordville. In that crash, a tractor trailer crossed the median and collided with a 15-passenger van. 11 people, including the truck driver, died. Our investigation determined that the truck driver lost control of his vehicle because he was using his cell phone at the time of the crash. 
please note that most major truck and bus carriers now prohibit the use of mobile devices while the vehicle is in motion. More than 38,000 people were killed on the nation's highways in 2020, the largest number of fatalities since 2007. About 10% of those deaths were attributed to distracted driving. And even with that high number, we think it is likely grossly underestimated because there is no reliable method to determine how many crashes involve portable electronic devices, making the true scope of this issue very difficult to know. It's certainly much larger than reported. And I'd like to point out that every one of the distracted drivers who caused these crashes was certain they could multitask effectively. Tragically, they were dead wrong. What we do know is that the risk of a crash is higher when a driver uses an electronic device. And studies clearly make the case that the use of portable electronic devices by drivers is dangerously a distraction. And it's not just about holding a device in your hand or glancing away from the road. It's the mental strain from the driving tasks. This causes drivers to miss critical events, objects, cues, and lose control, all potentially leading to a crash. It's this cognitive distraction that appears to have the biggest impact on distracted driving. Distracted drivers not only put themselves at risk, but everyone else using the road to reduce the crashes, injuries, and deaths. Drivers must disconnect and focus on the driving. Even a momentary distraction can have catastrophic consequences. Now, adopting a safe driving behavior free use of electronic devices is going to require a cultural shift and it's going to take an integrated approach something we call a safe systems approach the approach of smart laws solid education and intelligent enforcement has worked in the past with the widespread use of seatbelts before seatbelts were required only 14 percent of occupants used them after states started passing seatbelt laws, their use jumped to 59%. And today, with stronger seatbelt laws, high visibility enforcement and education campaigns, seatbelt usage is approximately 90%. States such as Kentucky with the strongest laws, those enabling primary enforcement have the highest usage rate. A significant number of lives can be saved and life-altering injuries can be avoided if Kentucky strengthens its law to prohibit the non-emergency use of portable electronic devices that do not support the driving task. We must establish a culture of safety that deems distracted driving both unacceptable, just as we do for alcohol impaired driving these are both lifestyle choices that result in the death and injury of innocence. House Bill 258 sends a clear message. Distracted driving is unacceptable. It is time to acknowledge that distracted driving is a fatal safety risk, not just to distracted drivers, but to everyone on the road. No text, no call, no update is ever worth a human life. We thank you for your consideration, and I would be pleased to answer any questions you might have. And I apologize for my voice, but here in the Southland, uh, the pollen is blowing hard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair Landsberg. Next to have a guest is Jennifer Smith. First met Jennifer a few years ago at NCSL in Nashville. She was presenting on this topic uh, shortly after Tennessee had adopted similar legislation. So Jennifer, good to have you this morning. Please proceed. You're on mute, Jennifer. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, Chair Representative, and thank you, Chairman Rowland and other committee members for having me here. Um, I am with StopDistractions.org. We are an organization that consists of families of victims that have been impacted by distracted driving across the country. We work on changing the culture behind distracted driving and saving lives so no one has to experience what we have been through. 
Um, I recall just a couple years ago, I came out to Kentucky to speak at the first committee hearing in the interim study, and there had just been a crash, uh, a severe crash where there was a fatality because a truck driver was watching video while driving, if I recall correctly. These crashes are happening every day. The, the big support of these bills is, the, like they said, the polling, the constituents want it. In every state, we are seeing over 80% constituent support. We all know we shouldn't be on our phones while driving. This law is about preventing injuries and saving lives. It's not about writing tickets. It's about changing the culture to make roads safer so families can be at home with one another. This law will give increased ability to enforce the law. Like he said, there is a texting law, but these laws have not evolved with the technology. If you know, uh, if anyone has a child that's, you know, under 35, they FaceTime when they make phone calls. They don't call just, you know, hands-free or handheld. These are behaviors we need to address. People are live streaming while they're driving. So the, the current law is just outdated and unenforceable. By removing the phone from the driver's hand, it removes all of the ambiguity. You know, it's very simple to enforce. Currently, 24 states plus D.C. do have these laws. And the benefit of these laws is starting to show in those states. Um, the, the disadvantage we have is states without these laws are seeing significant rises in cell phone use while driving since the pandemic. We are looking at telematics data, and it's showing that drivers are using their phones to type and swipe up to 50% more before they were, before 2020. And with speeding, you know, just as drivers are speeding more, I saw data last week that speeding is starting to normalize, but those phone calls and that telematics are just skyrocketing. With these laws, you do see benefits. Drivers do immediately stop typing and swiping. We have telematics data from Georgia showing a 22% drop the day the law went into effect. That law has been very successful. From 2016 to 2019, adjusted for traffic and population, traffic fatalities in Georgia have decreased by 12%. When you look at just the distracted driving crashes, 2019 versus 2017, there was a 48% drop in those crashes. These laws are working. Um, we also have, we could look at Indiana. Indiana passed their law in July of 2020. That year, they saw the lowest number of distracted driving crashes they had seen in over a decade. These laws don't cost constituents extra money to com comply. You can get hands-free phone mounts now from anywhere to one to five dollars that you can put in your air vents. The phone can work with speakerphone if you don't have Bluetooth capability. There's apps you can download on your phones for free that make it work with voice activation. So these laws are easy to comply with. Um, there's a root insurance telematics report sh shows that states with strict primary enforcement laws has significantly fewer incidents of distracted driving, with 75% of those states falling below the national baseline for distracted driving events. The American Academy of Pediatrics also says that these device, these Handheld device bans are associated with the greatest decrease in motor vehicle fatalities, 11% lower motorcyclist fatalities. I could go on and on with the data, but I really, I think the bottom line is we all know we should be focused on the road. Drivers want this law to make them focus on the road, and we all do know it's the right thing to do. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I thank you for your time. Mr. Chair, if I can make a couple of additional brief comments before we take questions. Uh, I want to point out there's nothing in this legislation that prevents someone from talking on their telephone while they're driving. Uh, a lot of the newer vehicles, my truck has Bluetooth technology. I do, I, I, do a lot, I do a lot of talking while I'm driving. You know, we're short on time. I've got, a, I've got, my truck has a center console with cup holders. I've got a, one of those uh, devices you put in. It kind of hangs out there. Uh, I can, this law allows somebody to use one finger to initiate an action on the phone. If you receive a call, push that button. You can talk to that person. Uh, the law does allow a grace period of three months as it's written before enforcement. Uh, just a few of the highlights I wanted to mention, and I'll say this. Uh, no piece of legislation is perfect. Uh, 
uh, over the summer in the interim. If you have questions today, if you have questions over the interim, I'd be happy to work with any of you uh, and discuss any concerns you might have and see if we can come to resolutions because uh, this issue is not going away. Uh, just uh, last week, I was stopped at a red light out on 127 coming into the Capitol in the right-hand lane, and gentleman in the left-hand lane. Uh, the whole time uh, we were there at that traffic light, he was on his phone. The light turned green. I looked over. He started off. Guess what? He was still on his phone looking down. So we'll be happy to entertain any questions or comments you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Tipton, and thank you for your work on this issue. Um, I am supportive of this. Obviously, this was an NCOL model that came through the Property and Casualty Committee uh, that I get the privilege to chair at NCOL. Uh, and to me, it's not about increased penalties, but it's about changing habits. Um, like was mentioned, you know, probably when I was a kid, nobody wore a seatbelt. But I think Vice Chair Landsberg mentioned probably 90% of the people today um, do wear a seatbelt. And I, I think it's potentially because of the law that we have on the books that says you got to wear a seatbelt. Um, and then to the comment that uh, Vice Chair Landsberg made also, that 2010 accident was before I was elected to the General Assembly, but that's in a district that happened in a district that Representative Meredith used to represent and then I represent now, and that family, uh, it, Mennonite family, actually lives in a district that I still represent. So I know that accident uh, very well. It made national news and, and was very tragic. So we do have a um, couple of three questions so far. Uh, the first will go to Representative Roberts. Thank you, and thanks for bringing this um, before us. I have one quick question just about the rollout for it. I don't see in here any kind of an appropriation for a marketing campaign about around this, and I just was wondering if you um, were supportive of that and what you thought we might be able to do to make sure that we get the word out about this good project. Well, one thing I do know is the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet is already promoting this concept. Uh, they, they are very, they're very adamant. And, they're, and I've been in contact and worked with them on this legislation as well about the Buckle Up Phone Down Kentucky. Uh, we didn't put anything in here. Like you said, it's a, the legislation's a work in, progr pro in progress. Uh, Mark, did you have, are you aware of any comments, any comments on that from the insurance perspective? Groups? Uh, just to uh, echo that comment, uh, the Kentucky Office of Highway Safety has uh, done a lot of promotional programs in the past. I'm sure that uh, if it related to enforcement, they would be doing that. Uh, some of the larger insurers also uh, run uh, promotional ads about uh, safety and so on. So I, I'm quite sure that uh, both industry and government would step up to uh, promote the idea. Uh, Representative Lockett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a question really about um, enforcement of, of the bill. Um, I noticed towards the end there are some fines, of course, I guess, if you got pulled over and the officer saw that you had your phone out. Um, of course, you can see someone if, if they have a seatbelt on, so that's um, easily done. So my question comes um, on the second page. It talks about um, in Section C, uh, it says that other than viewing data mapping related to navigation, so if you're on, um, you know, using GPS, directions, and so forth, I'm assuming what this means is that you can be holding your phone for that. Um, so I guess my question becomes, how does a police officer, how does that person that pulls you, that, that pulls the person over, how do they know what you're doing on your phone? And you mentioned like you like you were allowed to use one finger to, you know, uh, uh, punch a button. Well, what if you use two? I mean, I know that's silly, but but it's a kind of my question would be how do you enforce this? Thank you for that question, and I think I'll start with we're talking about the difficulty with enforcing the texting law, is because uh, right now it's illegal to text and drive. So how does a law enforcement officer know? that uh, a, a simple defense is, well, I, were, I was on Facebook. I was checking my email. Under the current law, that's, that's not against the law. It only specifies texting. And, and to your point, uh, yes, you can have a navigation device, but you cannot hold that phone in your hand. You cannot hold that phone the way the laws are written with either hand or supported by your body. Uh, so if, you, if, you've got, like, if you've got maps like I have on my phone, 
I mentioned I've got that center console. I can plug my maps in. Now, you need to plug your desti destination in before you start driving. Uh, get that in there, but you can, you can have that there where you can view that. That's allowed under this legislation. But the way the law enforcement officer would be able to enforce this, they would actually have to see you uh, with a hand, with a phone, or some type of electronic device in your hand. I will tell you that in Tennessee, uh, it was mentioned, I mentioned that NCSL conference. The, the way they got the message out is the state police in Tennessee had a bus going down the interstate, and it was marked Tennessee State Police. And there were troopers on that bus with cameras. And as people were going by, they were taking pictures. And they were radioing other troopers down the road. The message got out pretty soon. That, uh, you know, that, that's how they, that was just a rollout of that to try to get public opinion on that. But, but to answer your question, a law enforcement officer would have to, uh, not, would be able to identify the offense if you had a phone or electronic device in your hand or supported by your body. Yeah, and it actually, Representative, if you look at subsection A above that, uh, where it defines use or uses, it talks about use or uses includes, you know, the very first thing is holding a device in your hand. Now, that means it has to be up on a mount, either, you know, I've got an air vent mount that I use. Uh, Representative Tipton has a cup holder mount where you can look and see it without holding it your hand. But even then, when it's on the mount, you're not allowed to watch a video or whatever. You know, it occurred to me last fall when we were drafting this legislation that there was nothing in the bill as drafted then that would have prevented me from logging into my Hulu account and watching the World Series as I was driving down the road until, you know, that's one of the reasons this is in here that we wanted to specifically prohibit it. You know, your kids or grandkids ought to be able to watch in Canto uh, going down the road, but you shouldn't be if you're driving. I agree with that, but uh, let's just not talk about Bruno. Thank you. Um, we do have three more questions, and since this is discussion only this morning, we'll wrap it up after that. Uh, we have one more Senate bill, and I see that Judiciary Committee staff is already gathering outside because they take over this room at noon. So, uh, certainly a discussion that I want to have, but uh, we'll move on after these three questions. Next is Representative Kirk McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it's I think it's going to be a wonderful bill. Every time I, I'm on the highway, I see people on their phones, and this really concerns me because I know the damage that can be done in an auto accident, and uh, if it saves just one life, um, we've we've done our deal do, uh, we've done our duty as legislators. So I'm looking forward to the bill coming. Thank you, uh, Representative Stevenson. Thanks, Chair. And I just have a comment. Um, Rep. Tipton, you know, I signed on to this bill with you. I think it's a I think it's a good bill. I think if every single person in this room were honest, we are all guilty of it at some point. Um, but I think looking around this room, we are all um, experienced drivers. I'm not calling us old, but um, but I do worry about our young people. I mean, all of us, we have become you know, we're so accustomed to just being on our phone all the time. It's our computer, it's our calendar, it's it's everything to us. Um, but our kids even more so, you know, they are just constantly tied to their phone and texting their friends. And so, um, you know, I, I think the bill, uh, even though many of us probably need it, I'm, I'm most happy um, for our young kids that as they start learning to drive, that they know automatically that that phone has to go down. Thanks. Representative McPherson. Thank you, Chairman Rowland. My question would be for the insurance companies. Have you all thought about maybe uh, signing or giving some kind of discount for people that would purchase hands-free devices and maybe would sign an agreement within the to say that they would that they would agree to, to drive hands-free? Is that something y'all would consider? That would be up to you know. Of course, insurance is a competitive market, and that is something that uh, I'm sure a lot of insurers would look at. Uh, Basically, what hap what ends up happening oftentimes, of course, is claims drive premiums. The higher the claims are, the higher the premiums are in general. Oh, uh, you know, but there are a lot of discounts for a lot of things. So I, you know, if if it made actuarial sense, which 
would the problem is it kind of enforcing it but uh or you know but if you were to sign know. something it kind of holds you accountable and them account and if you know they purchased right. it you know they have it you know they haven't they have to show it to you that they purchased it or right but the, the potential is there i yeah. will say that thank you uh, my guess is some of the telematics apps that the insurance companies are using today probably would would know if you have that device and, and possibly have a discount built into it um, I am going to allow one more question from a good friend, Representative Flannery, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Try to make this quick. Um, I support the intent, absolutely, and I think we all recognize that we need to do things to make the roadways as safe as possible. I guess my question is more from the, for the insurance industry. 189 already requires motorists to exercise the operation of vehicle um, in a careful manner with regard to pedestrians and and other vehicles on the roadway so is there a deficiency in current statute that you think this will address because i, I mean i think that's it's very simple language but it's very all-encompassing as well so what will this do to to add upon that well representative i think it just adds a degree of specificity and as representative tipton and others have alluded to you know, a texting law is much more difficult to enforce. Well, I wasn't texting, I was emailing or whatever. A hands-free law is kind of binary. You're either holding your phone or you're not. So in that way, it's a lot easier for law enforcement to decide whether you're committing a violation or not. But I mean, do they? can they not already say that I saw you using whatever device and that therefore it's not careful or you were behaving in a reckless manner it wouldn't be illegal to be holding a cell phone right now oh uh, <laughs> i i had that silence that's very timely mark it was <laughs> you only use yeah, one the, finger uh, i noticed too yeah, so one finger that, that was the uh purdue fight song for those of you wondering but anyway oh uh, where was <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I. <laughs> well, Mark, I'll pick up. All right, if I, could, if I could add to that, Representative Flannery, you know, this is the intent's not to be punitive. As Representative Stevenson said, we've all developed bad habits as drivers, mm -hmm. and I'm guilty. I'll be at a red light. I'm in a hurry. I'll check something. What's going on? I think this is more about public awareness and just making people aware that we need to improve our bad habits, not only to be safer for ourselves, but safer for other people on the road, and hopefully that other people will practice safety because we have loved ones who are out there on the road too. I, I see this as, as just reinforcing uh, the need and making people aware uh, of the need to uh, get rid of some of those bad driving habits when it comes to distractions and, 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 and devices that we use. And uh, just to follow up on that, the point I was going to make, if an officer observed you, say, drifting across lanes, he could certainly pull you over and maybe cite you for reckless driving. This, uh, I, th I think the hands-free law does a couple things. One, it helps to build the culture, and the other, it provides a more enforceable mechanism. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tipton Mark, for being here. A uh, special thank you to Vice Chair Landsberg with the NTSB and Ms. Smith. Thank you all for being here and taking the time to uh, discuss this issue with us today. Um, we will move along now to um, Senate Bill 298. Uh, our good friend, the co-chairman from over in the Senate, Senator Carpenter, is here to present that bill with Commissioner Vice. Whenever you're ready, introduce yourself for the record, and you all may proceed. Uh, Jared Carpenter, Senator from 34th District, and I knew five minutes was going to cost me 45 minutes. <laughs> Life lesson there. I'm Charles Weiss. I'm the Commissioner for the Department in Kentucky, Department of Financial Institutions in Kentucky. And I, this bill is was brought by, by the Commissioner, and so instead of belaboring the <clears> issues, <throat> I'm just going to let him jump right into it so we can get done here, All Representative right. Rowland. And I will provide a brief explanation and if, uh, then take questions after that. <clears throat> First, I want to thank Chair Rowland and the members of the committee for considering this bill today. Also, too, and express my appreciation to you for uh, your support of the department over the years, and I enjoyed working with you, so thank you so much for that, Chair Rowland. I also want to thank Senator Carpenter for sponsoring Senate Bill 298. Uh, the securities industry is important to Kentucky's economy and capital formation. 
There are over 160 state registered investment advisors, and these advisors have over $3 billion in assets under management. Uh, the department has discussed this initiative and in, the initiatives in 298 with the industry, and they are aware of the requirements of the bill. The bill does three common sense things. Number one, it would require all investment advisors registered in Kentucky to establish written policies and procedures relating to business continuity and succession planning, but also require uh, the, each investment advisor to develop, develop and implement uh, written policies regarding physical security and cybersecurity. And finally, Senate Bill 298 would also create a new section in KRS 292 to establish a continuing education requirement for investment advisor representatives. Um, like my motion? We have a motion and a second. Uh, let's see if we have any questions from uh, from the committee members. All right. Seeing no questions, you all have done a fine job with your explanation this morning. I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll, and since this is the last time I'll probably get to call the roll, I'm going to have her do it in reverse again. So, <laughs> Madam Clerk. Representative Westrom. Representative Upchurch. Yes. Representative Stevenson. Representative Smith? Yes. Representative Santoro? Representative Roberts? Yes. Representative Pollock? Yes. Representative Meredith? Yes. Representative McPherson? Yes. Representative Lockett? Yes. Representative Lewis? Yes. Representative Cole Carney? Yes. Thank you. Representative Koenig? Representative Kirk McCormick? Yes. Representative Hatton? Yes. Representative Gooch? Yes. Representative Fraser Gordon? Yes. Representative Flannery? Yes. Representative Fisher? Yes. Representative Bentley? Yes. Chairman Rowland? Yes. Uh, and the motion does pass. Unfortunately, in the House, we do not have consent. Uh, but I feel good about your chances getting it through on the House floor. Uh, thank you all for being here. I know Senator Carpenter is relieved, and now he can concentrate on that big fishing tournament that he's got this week. That's weekend. right. I, I show up to fish, and I, I said, I, I've got to go over here and use the facilities. And I walk <laughs> down the dock, and who do I see on the dock? It was Bart Rowland. So. Some <laughs> of us were working, and some of us were playing. Yeah, but, you look yeah. like he's really getting after it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I do want to say uh, I appreciate the opportunity. It's been a great relationship you and I have had with the Senate Banking and Insurance and the House Banking and Insurance Committee, and not all committees – have the same relationship and you know we've developed a great friendship and it's been really good so i'm trying to look around here if i get reelected and come back and sometimes i wonder if that's really what i want should do or not anymore but if i do uh, i'm trying to look see who my our next chairman will be so i'm sure they've got big shoes to fill but i do want to extend the hosp uh, appreciation for everything you've done in your friendship i appreciate those comments and you got to take me fishing now okay so seeing no other business to come before the committee 